encourage you this morning from the gospel lesson and specifically the command that Jesus gives to us to be filled with love for one another, to embody Christ in us and strive to live in that love all of our days. That's a really good thought for you confirmant. To be filled with Christ's love and strive to embody that love all of your days. So, anybody familiar with this book, Love You Forever? 1986 children's picture book by Robert Munch. I think, our, I think we got it when our oldest turned one year old and it was one of our favorites, a staple of the evening read, book read. If you are familiar with it, you'll enjoy hearing the, the theme again. If you're not, let me tell you about it. There is a wonderful mother that has a beautiful little son. And every night, she goes to see that son, picks that son up out of the cradle, and sings the following lullaby. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The book details some adventurous activities that the little child goes through when he's two years old, nine years old, and when he's a teenager. And after all of those episodes, after all of the mayhem that went on during the day, the mother still goes up into that room, picks up that child, and sings a lullaby. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Eventually, the child goes off to college. The mother goes into her garage, grabs a ladder, goes into the the child's dorm room, picks up this college student while he's sleeping and all of his his, uh, roommates are sleeping and sings the song. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. Eventually, the son moves out, gets his own home, and the mother still goes over to his house, gets the ladder, climbs up to her adult son's room, picks him up out of his bed, he stays sleeping, and sings a lullaby. I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby will be. Eventually, the mom gets older. Now, the son goes over to his mother's house, picks up his mother, and sings the lullaby. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mother you'll be. So that's the second to last page in the book. The last page of the book, the son has a child of his own, and he's in his own room, and he picks up his own little baby daughter and sings the song, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. And it underscores for us how that motto and theme of love is carried on from generation to generation. So I'm talking about love today. And we can use the word in different ways. We can use the word love as a noun, as in I love something. We can use the word love as a feeling, as an emotion, as a sensation. And it's really interesting about the English word for love is that we can use the word love for a multitude of things, can't we? We can love ice cream, we can love pizza, we can love our sports team, we can love our spouse, we can love our children, we can love our car, we can love our home, and we use the word love for all of that. But the greatest expression of love is when love functions as a verb. The Greek word for that is agape. Agape means a total, self-giving, self-sacrificing love, a love that loves for the sake of loving. And of course, the example for us is Jesus Christ. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Agape. 
total self-giving, self-sacrificing love, a love that loves for the sake of loving. That's Christ. Christ is our example of love. And as his children, Christ calls on us to reciprocate that love to him, but also to one another. Love is a verb. Love is doing. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians gives us a really good definition of love as a verb. He says, this is what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but always rejoices, always protects, always perseveres. And then he adds this grand addendum, that type of love never fails. But the Apostle Paul adds something very interesting at the end of it. He talks about developing this love in our lives is a process. It's not like a light switch. It's not like it's on and it's off. It's about developing this type of love for others and love for God in our lives. This is what he says. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the childish ways behind me. So that's a wonderful exhortation for us to strive for that godly love in our lives. It's a daily process. Confirmation. It's a daily process of growing and embodying that robe of righteousness that you are clothed in each and every day. Let me highlight how Christ is the ultimate example of love. Of course, the greatest example of what Jesus Christ did, he came to this world, he lived and died for us. And what he got in return for that is his death. What he got in return for that is the glory of his heavenly Father at having accomplished our redemption. God the Father said, this is great. This is what I wanted. And God the Son says, thank you, Heavenly Father. Let me highlight this verse. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he, that's Christ, lay down his life for his friends. That's you and me. You and I are my friends. This is Jesus talking. He says, I consider you my friends as you follow this command. So, of course, God's love for us is not conditional. God's love for us is steady and constant. But Christ desires of us that we strive to embody that love, his love, in our daily actions. Here's another passage. This is from the book of Hebrews. So we read in the Gospels of all of these amazing things that Jesus did. Jesus taught and Jesus healed. Jesus did amazing miracles. But one thing we always don't notice in the Gospels is what Jesus is doing when he's by himself. What's striking about the Gospels is how many times Jesus spent time with himself and his heavenly Father. There's a couple of instances where Jesus even says to his disciples, guys, get going, get in the boat, go to the other side. I need my personal time with the Heavenly Father. And the book of Hebrews details for us what Jesus is doing during those times. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. So that's a prayer to his Heavenly Father, basically saying what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. If there's any other way for this whole redemption thing to be accomplished, show me now, but not my will, but thine be done. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So he learned obedience to his heavenly father's will by his willingness to go the way of sorrows. He was made perfect at his resurrection. So what does it mean? What does it mean to love the way of Christ? Here's five examples. Our view of love can be self-centered. Paul in Galatians says we reap what we sow. So the significance of that word agape, total self-giving, self-sacrificing love, 
Sometimes in our lives, especially to those that are close to us, we love to get something in return, especially in marriage relationships. I do this, and you do that. And my love for you is based on you doing that. And if you're not doing that, I'm not going to do this. I'm not saying that we allow ourselves to get walked over in our relationships with others. But ultimately, embodying Christ's selfless love for us shows itself in a willingness to love for the sake of loving because of Christ who loved us. Here's the next one. Love shows and expresses itself through forgiveness. From the book of Jeremiah, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So here's kind of a trick question. Can you forgive and forget? Not really, right? We don't have a magic spiritual eraser that we can just scratch on our head and we can forget what wrongs have been done to us. But we can forgive and forget when we no longer allow those situations that have impacted, however serious they might be, to no longer influence us in our relationships with other people. One of my favorite stories is a story of Clara Barton. Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross. And it doesn't seem like people would actually be opposed to something like that. Back when she started it, there were people there were individuals that were. There were individuals that wrote and said very horrible, nasty things about her, that she was just starting this organization to try and better herself. Eventually, of course, as you all know, individuals saw the worth of that and that negativity was dampened. Later on in her life, she was talking to one of her associates, and the associate says, you remember when that person did and said that? And Claire Barton asked, acted as if she didn't remember. And then she added this line, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Isn't that great? I distinctly remember forgetting it. So it's not like we can magically erase wrongs that have been perpetuated against us, but we can choose to intentionally hang on to them hang on to that bitterness in our lives because it feels so good at the time, or we can let go of it. Of course, the cross of Jesus Christ is our strength and motivation to do just that. Here's the next one. Love frees us from the tyranny of self-love. So the quote that I'm going to share with you in a little bit is from Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. So it may seem somewhat of an odd statement for me to say it, uh, but that was one of the most impactful books for me in my life. And I have a library full of books that deal with theology and discernment, understanding God's plan for us, God's grace, God's act of redemption, how the Holy Spirit comes to us, and that's a lot of head knowledge. But the one book that first impacted me the most was The Purpose Driven Life. And this is the very first line of the book. It's not about you. It's kind of like a two by four upside of the head. It's not about you. He goes on, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. It's all about God. So, confirmands, as you embark on your next career in your life, you're going to be thinking, what am I, what am I supposed to do? What should I do with my life? All those things are good and wonderful, but if you do not have the foundation of Jesus Christ, it's going to fall flat. Not just for confirmants, but for all of us. Everything begins 
and centers around God. It begins with feeding our faith, understanding God's will, God's purpose for us in our lives, and striving to make his will, his truth, the epicenter of our lives. Here's the next one. Love focuses on others. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, says to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Ultimately, that's one of the greatest expressions of love is when you live to serve others, whatever capacity, whatever vocation you're doing. Ultimately, all of us are given an opportunity to serve others. And as we serve others, we ourselves are fulfilled in our willingness to use whatever gifts and abilities we have to build each other up. Here's the last one. Love for God that shows itself in love to others and directs us to see the big picture. So this passage here is, is one of my favorite passages from Genesis. I'll tell you my second favorite one in a little bit. Uh, but Genesis 41, 51, God has made me forget all my troubles. So the guy that said this is Joseph. Remember Joseph? Joseph gets sold into slavery by his brothers. How's that for a dysfunctional family? He gets sold into slavery down in Egypt. He arrives in the home of, of Potiphar. Mrs. Potiphar has it out for him, so then all of a sudden he ends back up in prison. He languishes in prison for a long time until a guy by the name of Pharaoh has some dreams and, Pharaoh, and Joseph says, hey, I can tell you what they mean. Boom, second in command in all of Egypt, the empire of Egypt. Joseph meets a beautiful Egyptian woman, marries her. He has a couple of sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He names the second one Manasseh, and he says, the reason I chose Manasseh because it means God has made me forget all my troubles. It's kind of striking, isn't it? It's not like Joseph is thinking, hey, I wonder how I got down here in Egypt. Of course he remembers. But Joseph lives with the truth of something that he says later on to his brothers, Genesis 50, verse 21. After dad dies and the brothers are thinking, this is payback time, Joseph says, you intended to harm me, God intended it for good. So in our lives, it is motivated, being motivated by God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We strive to embody that love, even in trying and difficult situations, because Christ's love is the difference. So, dear compromise, be filled with Christ's love for you. Keep that firm foundation of Jesus Christ in your life. Go out and do amazing things, but keep Christ as your center. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome again, members and visitors. Pray that we're strengthened and encouraged through word and sacrament. Next week, we're going to take a look in the book of Psalms, looking up when looking down. Until then, go with grace, live in peace.